Hi. Hi. What is your name? Uh, my name is Kim McNair. What was your date of birth? 12-27-52, way back a long time ago. When did you first move to Central Florida? I'm sorry? When did you first move to Central Florida? Uh, I think I moved to New Smyrna in 1962 from uh, South Georgia, believe it or not. Hurricanes, uh, being at the beach all the time. My parents had a motel about a block off the beach on Flagler Avenue in New Smyrna. It's called, uh, what is it now, the uh, Seahorse, I believe. And they managed that motel. We moved down from Georgia to do that. And uh, I was on the beach every day from a little kid on in my whole life, pretty much. Uh, surfing. Just love to surf. Beach all the time. Uh, there's so many. I've got millions. <laughs> what encouraged you to join the Safari Club? Uh, I know all these guys. They all grew, I all grew up with all these guys, and uh, they've. I've been in and out of the club many years. At one point, they were a little too political for me, and I would go and listen to all this political stuff going on, and I'm more of a play-it-by-ear, improvisational kind of guy. And uh, I, I enjoy the contest aspect of the, of the club, and I uh, also have a band, and we play for their Safari Club party every year. And uh, that's the most fun, because they have great food and great friends and get a couple hundred people together, as you know, and, always turns out to be a good time. Altogether, how long have you been a part of the club? Uh, 25, 30 years, off and on, yeah. What are some of the goals the club has? I believe the club is uh, basically looking to help young surfers with scholastic uh, improvement, uh, being able to get them into college, uh, they raise money for uh, kids to be able to get scholarships, and uh, which is a, a great thing to do in my in my book. Uh, How old were you when you first learned to surf? I started surfing. I bought my first surfboard in April of 1964, and I had been riding back in the old days. There used to be float stands on the beach. And they would basically have these canvas floats that were about, you know, this long. And they had yellow vinyl on one end and canvas in the middle. And uh, we would pump them up extremely tight, as tight as a basketball, and go out and catch waves and stand up on them and ride them. But when we couldn't afford a surfboard at the time, so we would just learn to surf on a float. And uh, I can remember uh, tourists being in the water and the waves being six, seven feet. And I'd paddle out through the shore break and take off on a wave and try to run over the tourists. <laughs> little, little kids are weird, you know, they, they do crazy things. But that's how I learned to surf was on those. And they're much harder to ride than a surfboard. So. What got you interested in surfing and how did it intrigue you? Uh, I don't remember ever something that triggered it. I just knew everybody was surfing in New Smyrna at the time. There were a lot of guys. Uh, there's a famous picture of everybody standing on the beach uh, that probably everybody's seen with about 20 surfboards all lined up taken at Flagler Avenue and that's where I surfed. And so I knew all these guys. In fact, I know everybody in that picture. And for some reason I wasn't there that day. I believe I had a surfboard by that time, but I don't know. I just maybe was doing something else that morning and didn't get in the picture, but uh, just all my friends. And I was hanging out at the beach, and all those guys were there at Flagler Avenue. That was the surf spot uh, where the boardwalk is now at Flagler Avenue uh, back then. There wasn't any inlet, or we didn't, there was a place up on the North Beach that we surfed a little bit, and then Bethune Beach. We surfed down there, and uh, just seeing really good surfers. Some of these guys are incredibly good. And uh, 
for me being on a float a couple times, getting that figured out. Uh, I remember one incident, uh, Buddy Wright, who was one of the best surfers back in that day, 63 probably, I was paddling out, and this guy was my idol. I mean, I, he was the best surfer, had the best style. I'm paddling out on my little float, and I'd never even been on a surfboard before. And he comes paddling by on his surfboard, and he says, uh, hey, kid, you want me to teach you how to surf? And I go, no, I already know how. Like, and I just, I have kicked myself a million times for saying that to them. Having my idol teach me to surf would have been the coolest thing, but me being a, a crazy little kid, you know, paddling on my float, oh, I already know how to surf. Don't worry about it. But I really didn't. Are there any major differences in surfing now compared to when you first began? Oh, sure. Uh, back then, there were only 20 or 30 surfers in the whole area. And uh, we all knew each other, and uh, longboards. We were all riding longboards. They were all nine feet or longer, and they weighed 25, 30 pounds. Uh, no surf leash. If you fell off, you swam all the way to the beach. Uh, surfing had a lot more style back then. Uh, if you watch the pro contests nowadays, everybody looks pretty much the same. They're all doing the same maneuvers. Uh, there's guys that stand out, you know, from the pack, Kelly Slater, John John Florence, those guys are do amazing thing on surfboards. And skating, uh, basically on skateboards, evolved the whole surfing thing into the aerial thing where guys would go up and, and jump out of a pool on a skateboard. Well, they figured out, well, if I can do that on a skateboard in a pool, why can't I do it on a wave? And so that evolved into all the aerial maneuvers that you see nowadays that are real high scoring and very prominent in all the magazines. Uh, back then, we basically turned, angled the board. The boards didn't have hard edges in the, in the back. They had real soft rails in the tail and a big giant fin. So you were basically riding on the fin the whole time. And the board didn't accelerate like boards do now. Uh, they basically, you got to the bottom and you turned, your board went one speed. You would go up the wave and you would run up to the nose and you'd hang five or you'd hang ten, which guys still do and I still do to this day. But I evolved about 1968 surfboards. The shortboard revolution hit from uh, Australia and the boards automatically dropped almost a foot in length just like overnight. And then they started getting shorter and shorter and shorter until they went down to about five foot. Uh, you know, guys nowadays are even riding four, four foot surfboards. And, uh, you know, surfboards, I went all the way through that whole evolutionary process with surfboards and all the way back to riding longboards again. And when you get old like me, you tend to uh, go back to riding longboards because they catch waves easier. You can sit out farther and catch waves easier and you ride them all the way to the beach. Shortboards are a lot more work. And uh, I have a few guys that are my age that are still trying to hang on <laughs> to the shortboard era, but they have a hard time in the water all the time. And I watch them, I go, oh, why don't you gotta get a longboard and have a lot of fun? So. How often do you surf? I surf uh, three to four times a week still. Uh, it depends on how good the waves are. <clears throat> if the waves are crummy for, you know, two weeks, I might not surf for two weeks. But if the waves are good, for 10 days in a row, I'll surf every day. So after you've been surfing, uh, I'm coming up on 49 years, uh, you will basically, you've seen it all and you've done it all. And uh, the waves have to be pretty good to get you excited. You just don't go out and ride choppy little two foot, you know, sloppy waves anymore. It's no fun, so. Have you ever been injured surfing? Oh yes, yes, plenty How of times. A uh, couple, mostly in really small waves, when the waves are two foot. Uh, I got smashed right here in the side of the head by my surfboard, got about 12 or 14 stitches, busted my chin open a couple times, and the worst time ever was uh, in about eight to 10 foot waves. And we were surfing up on the North Beach, and I was riding a little, a little fish, which is basically a, a little short board, it's about 5'10", five, 5 feet 10 inches long, with two fins, and they go really fast. I mean, they're extremely fast surfboards. 
and I had just paddled out, and the waves were incredible, offshore winds, you know, big giant barrels, and I took off on this wave, and I'm going backside, riding this wave, going faster and faster, and all of a sudden the wave comes up and starts to break ahead of me, and I'm going to go up and try to kick out of the wave, and the lip has already started to pitch out, so, and the wind's blowing offshore, so I wasn't going to make it to the top with my board, so I got about three feet from the lip, and I jumped and made it over the lip with my body, and I had a surf leash attached to, attached to my surfboard at the time, and I made it over the lip and landed behind the wave. Normally, you would get sucked over the falls, and the wave would just, just smash the crap out of you, but I made it, and the wind caught my board, and I didn't know this because I'm underwater at the time, and the board goes up in the air and does what's called a flyaway, and the board just spinning in the air along its longitudinal axis this way, spinning in the air, and as the board comes down, I'm just breaking the surface, and it comes down tail first, fin first, so the fin is shaped about like this, and the fin hit me right in the top of the head right here, and bounced off my skull, and peeled a beer can flap out of my head about this big, and was just hanging down, and, I, and I'm seeing stars and stuff, and I'm going, God, what's going on? And I look, and the whole front of me is blood red. And I go like this, and there's this, this flap hanging down on my forehead. And I peel it back up and hold it down, get on my surfboard, go paddling back out. Now I have to paddle all the way back out to where the crowd is. There's about eight of us out there, and they're all facing away from me. And I paddle up on my board, and I sit up, and blood's all, I'm completely covered in blood, because your head bleeds like crazy when you, when you bust it open. And I sit up on my board, and all these guys are sitting there looking out to sea, waiting for a big wave. And I go, hey. And they all turn around and look at me, and they go, unbelievable. And they come running over there, let me see, let me see. And my buddy, David Coffey, who I've been surfing with since I was a kid, he, had just, he hadn't even caught a wave yet. And I got this big, giant beer can flap out of my head. He goes, oh, we got we to gotta go to the hospital. This is bad. So we turned around and paddled in, and he was mad at me for a week because he didn't get to surf any of those good waves. And I got 33 stitches in my head. And I had to go to a wedding the following day. And I had two black eyes, swollen shut. My head was shaved, and a big bandage on top of my head, and a tuxedo. And I was in the wedding, wedding party, so it wasn't good. <laughs> what are some of your favorite memories surfing? In surfing? Oh, millions. Um, Traveling to exotic locations, uh, surfing in Mexico, 25, 30 foot waves, uh, a place called Puerto Escondido. It's about 125 miles south of Acapulco. And uh, it basically is about a quarter mile deep, about a quarter mile offshore. 5,000, well, well, about 5,000 feet deep, a quarter mile offshore. And it's right on the intertropical convergence zone where all the hurricanes start up. So these deep ocean swells will be pumped into Escondido. And there's no sandbars like we have out here. You know, we might have five or six sandbars. If you look when there's a big swell, the waves will be breaking way out. And they'll break and they'll die out and then they'll hit a deep spot and then they'll break again and the deep spot and then they'll break again until they get all the way to the beach. Well, there... <coughs> There's absolutely no sandbars except for one right on the beach. And the bottom comes straight up and hits a sandbar. And as you surf this wave, if you can paddle out, if you can make it out, the waves are 25 foot breaking in about four foot of water. And so when the wave breaks, the lip comes over and pierces that four foot of water and hits the sand and ricochets up to about 35 or 40 feet, the bounce coming off the, the white water breaking. So when you, when you paddle out, you see a wave coming, and it only looks about like a one-foot wave, but really it's a 25-foot wave. And so you're paddling in this, for this deep swell, and you're paddling and paddling, and then, then it's a two-foot wave. Then it's a four-foot wave. Then it's an eight-foot wave. Then you're paddling into a 10-foot wave. Then all of a sudden it's a 15 foot wave and this wave's growing the whole time because it's hitting a shallower and shallower sandbar. And then all of a sudden the wave's 25 foot 
and you're up here in the lip, and then the wind's blowing offshore trying to blow you back out of the wave. So you, as you stand up to catch the wave, there's a little bit of lag from the wind holding you up, and it's usually an airdrop about, about six feet where you fall from the lip down to the face of the wave, and you hit, and you turn, and as you turn, the wave hits the sandbar and throws out into a big giant barrel as wide as this room, and you stand in this huge barrel, and it sounds like you're, the space shuttle's going off right beside you, and you stand there and just go as fast as you can go down the line and hope that you make it out the end of the tube and come shooting out into the channel and turn and paddle back out. And it's extremely radical when you take off. Three things happen. You either make the drop, you pull out, or you fall when you drop and don't make it. Well, four things. Or you get sucked over the falls and get completely smashed. I saw a, a boogie board guy. I was on the beach filming. And this guy had dropped in on a wave. It was probably 25 foot. And he turned on his boogie board, and he's in the barrel. Waves tubing. He's riding along. And this guy's paddling on about an eight or nine foot gun, which is a long, skinny board made for big waves. Drops in, going down the wave. The spray had hit him in the face. And I'm watching this all through my camera. And he's wiping his eyes as he's dropping in on the wave. Never even sees the boogie board guy. As he turns, he just misses the boogie board guy and sprays the guy with his, with his spray coming off his board. Makes the guy straighten out. As the guy straightens out, the lip comes over, hits the guy in the butt, and blows him about 30 feet in the air doing endos on his boogie board. Comes down, and this guy rode all the way down the beach and kicked out. Never even saw the boogie board guy at all. Didn't even know he was there. And I got it on video. It was amazing. Where's your favorite location to surf? Uh... Surfed uh, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Costa Rica, Hawaii. Hawaii is the most beautiful, but it's the most fickle. Uh, there's a lot of surfers in Hawaii. Probably the best waves I ever surfed was in Costa Rica, a place called Witch's Rock. And it's up in northern Costa Rica. And you have to drive to this little town about three hours and get there at 4.30 in the morning and get on this little boat that's probably... 20, 25 feet long with a little canopy on it, you and six other people. And you pay this guy, I believe, 100 bucks for the day, and he brings water and fruit and sandwiches and whatever, and you drive about in the boat up the coast about 45 minutes, and you pull up, and there's this giant rock spire out in the ocean that's probably seven, eight, nine stories tall, just a big rock sticking up out of nowhere. And it's the strangest thing that it's out there. And the waves wrap around the spire and they cross over as they come in. And there will be a left over here and a right over here, which means I'm gonna go right. I'm a, I'm a regular foot surfer, which means I've got my left foot forward when I'm facing the wave. And if you were a goofy foot surfer and you went left, you would have your right foot forward facing the wave. Now you can go front side or back side, either way. So if I go left on a wave, I'm going back side. If I go right on a wave, I'm going front side. So basically you could catch a right and the wave would peel for a couple hundred yards down the beach or you could catch the left and the wave would peel for a couple hundred yards the other way down the beach. And it's the most amazing machine-like wave. It's a sandbar and there's absolutely no people around, no buildings, no stores, it's just the middle of nowhere. And it's a national park. And uh, I remember when I got there, I jumped out of the boat and immediately paddled all the way to the beach because I wanted to get a lay of the land. What, what's this wave doing? Because I've never been there. So I paddled into the beach, stood on the beach for about five minutes and watched. And you would see these perfect A-frame peaks coming. A-frame, basically a wave goes like this. And you want to take off right in the peak and go whichever way you're going to go. So I'm standing on the beach looking, and there's perfect right A-frames coming down the beach this way, and left's going this way, whichever way you wanted to go. So I end up paddling out, and as I'm paddling, I see this 15-foot wave break, and it's a perfect A-frame barrel just peeling down the beach like a machine. And I'm paddling out, and this wave's breaking. There's not a person on it. 
it's just peeling and it's getting a little smaller and a little smaller and it keeps going and it keeps going. This is like 30 seconds I'm watching this thing and it finally I'm getting right up to, to the, where the wave is only about three feet now and it's still peeling, peeling like a machine with this perfect little barrel and right when it gets to me it spits you know like the air is caught inside the wave and the little wave kind of closes out and it goes poof and just spits out this little poof of, of salt spray and I'm like that is the most amazing wave I've ever seen and we went out and surfed this wave for about four hours and every single wave was completely perfect like a machine I mean it was it was most incredible experiments of my, of my life I'm sorry? Have you ever surfed at any unique locations? Uh, yeah, there was a uh, very unique, it was just 20 minutes north of Witch's Rock, a place called Ollie's. And uh, my friend David Coffey and I were on the trip and we drove another 20 minutes. We came in and ate lunch. We drove another 20 minutes up the coast to this little spot. And it's more of a longboard wave. And we were riding longboards at the time. And it is a, it looks like somebody built it. It's, it, imagine the banked turn at Daytona, okay? But made out of rocks about this big around. Perfectly round boulders. And the whole beach is rounded out of these big boulders. An, an architect would have to go in there and put them just like that. And there's a rock sticking out where the wave peaks up. And we jump out of the boat and we paddle over there and it's like 30 shortboard guys. And shortboard guys and longboard guys tend to, tend to battle because longboard guys catch all the waves and shortboard guys have to sit inside farther and catch less waves. And myself and David go, oh, this is going to be a, a, a war. And so we paddle up and all 30 of these guys don't even know how to surf at all. They, they can't even catch a wave. And we go, are you kidding me? And we pull up, first big set comes, we take off, drop in on this wave, and this wave peels around this little Daytona embankment for about 200 yards. And it's just, it, just like, all, I mean, uh, Witch's Rock, but it's, it's softer. It doesn't break way out into the flats. It kind of crumbles at the top and rolls down. Perfect little longboard wave. You get on the nose and hang five for 100 yards. And a long nose ride in Florida is about eight or nine seconds. You could stand on the nose for 30 seconds and just stand there or hang 10 or hang five. A couple of times Dave and I took off both on the same wave. He's going backside, I'm going front side. He's hanging five at the top, I'm hanging five in the middle of the wave and we're both riding along talking to each other just riding down this perfectly groomed wave that just goes forever. Most, most insane thing we've ever done. Now the ride back was not good because we drove back into the wind and we were bouncing the whole time in this boat for an hour and probably an hour and 20 minutes back and I, I was about this much shorter by the time I got back to the hotel just from being, you know, pounded. It was horrible. But Does New Smyrna stand out to you? If so, why? New Smyrna Beach is probably the most consistent wave on the east coast of the United States. It always has a wave. I would say out of 365 days in a year, New Smyrna is surfable 360 days. And that's why it's such a popular surf spot. And back when I started, the inlet was no good. There wasn't a wave down there. And they started building the jetty in 1968, somewhere in there. and as the jetty began to get longer and longer, that wave started working. I graduated high school in 1971. In my senior week, we got to take a couple days off and me and my friend David drove down there and found this little wave. And it was just incredibly good. And we never ever surfed there before. And we surfed this wave for a whole week and all our buddies kept going, where have you guys been? Oh, we've just been hanging around, you know, just uh, keeping it a secret spot. And all of a sudden, one of our buddies drove down there and saw it, saw us surfing there. And he came out 
And then somebody else saw two cars down there and they came out. And then within about two weeks, everybody was surfing the inlet. And the inlet got better and better and more popular. And then they started having contests there. And now I, I, we probably have more surf contests at New Smyrna Inlet than any inlet, in an inlet, it's hard to say, any inlet on the east coast of the United States. And uh, it's because the waves are so consistent. A contest director can almost for sure be guaranteed that there's going to be a surfable wave there. And there's nothing worse than showing up for a contest and the waves are flat. And you got 200 paid entrants standing on the beach going, we can't ride that, you know. So that's, that's why, plus there's a great amount of, of really experienced pro surfers that live here and surf here. Yes, I, uh, in 1966, I entered my first contest, and I won it. As a, it was called Midgets Division back then, but now it's boys. And uh, basically, I was 13 years old and ended up uh, winning the contest. And then I entered every contest after that, pretty much, and won everything. Because I had been in the water so much from living right there at my mom's motel, uh, if you drive by this Seahorse Motel and you look, there's a little apartment on top of that. And if you, as you turn your corner on North Atlantic, you'll look up and there's a picture window facing the ocean. Well, the head of my bed was right at that picture window. And I didn't even have to get out of bed to check the surf. I could just raise my head up and <laughs> open the curtains and look out and see the waves were good. And I was out of the house and in the water before school. And I surfed, you know, seven days a week and on Saturday and Sunday all day long. So I got really good and had a lot of good surfers in the area to, to watch and progress from. So within a few years, 66, 67, 68, I won the Florida State Championships. I won uh, all the contests around there in 1969. Well, back up. In 68, we had a big giant contest come here to New Smyrna. And all the major surfboard companies came for the contest. Surfboards Hawaii, Hobie Surfboards, uh, Con Surfboards, they were all from Cocoa Beach. And inside of Surfer Magazine, Gary Proper model, Hobie Surfboards was on the inside cover of every issue. And they sold tons of these surfboards. Well, I'm a little kid in this contest. And I had made it through my quarterfinal heat and I was in the semifinals, and Gary Proper was judging the contest. And my friend Janie O'Hara, who owned Samarna Surf Shack, was scoring for Gary. Gary would go red, seven points. Uh, blue, everybody had different colored jerseys on. I was wearing red, for instance. Uh, I took off in a wave, and I'm riding this little wave, and Janie says to Gary, Kim's going to win this contest. And Gary goes, who's Kim? And she goes, that's Kim right there. And I did the best drop knee cutback I'd ever done in my whole life on this little wave. And I was riding a 9-8 surfboard, which for a little kid, I'm like this tall, and my surfboard's three times as long as I am. And I just turned this board on a dime and uh, hit the lip of the wave and go riding back down the wave. And Gary goes, wow. And so as I came in, Gary had told Janie, he says, if he wins this contest, tell him to come talk to me. I'll put him on the Hobie surf team, which was the elite surf team on the east coast of the United States. And so I, <laughs> I come out of the water, and Janie tells me, Gary Proper said he'll put you on the Hobie surf team. He was such a god in surfing till I didn't even dare talk to him. I was afraid of him. He was like, a, like John Wayne being a movie star. So I went out and practiced before the finals, and I won the contest. And when I came in, the Hobie Surf Team band had Hobie Surf Team painted on the side of it, and they had cranked up the engine, and they were about to back out, and Janie told me to go talk to Gary. And I walked over, and I went up and, and tapped on the window, and he was in the passenger side, and he rolled down the window, and he goes, hey, uh, oh, you're the little kid that won the contest. Here's my uh, phone number. Call me next week, and I'll give you a surfboard. You're on the Hobie Surf Team. And I was like flipping <laughs> completely out. And he gave me a Hobie Surf Team T-shirt at the time, too. So it was a pretty special moment. And after that, uh, let's see, I went on the following year. Uh, we went up the 
East Coast, there was a, I believe, a seven or eight circuit contest circuit all the way up the coast. And uh, the first contest I lost. The second contest I made it in the semis. And, but I won the paddle race. And the third contest, I won the surfing event and the paddle event. And that was the East Coast Championships in Virginia Beach. And I won every contest for the whole rest of the year after that. Undefeated paddling and surfing. And uh, it was a pretty special year for me. What is your favorite part of being in the Safari Club? The parties. Because <laughs> we, we get to play. My, all my friends uh, in our band, we, uh, we never rehearse when we, we, we were on the road many years playing, and we never rehearse. So we go to these gigs. Uh, we've all been playing 30, 40 years. So we go to these gigs and we never rehearse, and we always play for free for a membership in the Safari Club. And they have incredible food. We get up there and we just make it up as we go. We don't no, have no set list. We just show up and go, uh, what do you want to play? Uh, I don't know. Uh, how about uh, Born on the Bayou by Credence? What key? Okay, go. And the drummer starts it off and we play it and we sing it. And uh, everybody can sing. Everybody can play. And there's about five, there's six musicians in the band. And this is the same band. We call it the Safari Club band. And uh, it's just a throw together band. And we always have a blast because it's so much fun. We tell the audience up front, well, if we eat it during a song, there's going to be some train wrecks. Everybody laugh because we are because we don't know what we're doing. We're just making it up as we go. That's the most fun. How has surfing changed your life? Whew, that's a deep one. Um, I just love the ocean. I've been around it my whole life. Um, there's so many aspects of surfing that are, that are uh, I don't know, it's, it's such a giving, give and take with nature. Uh, it's never the same. I've never ridden the same wave twice. It's always different. Uh, every time you surf, even after 48 years, it's different every time. Uh, so many creatures in the ocean. You see the most crazy stuff in the ocean. Two weeks ago, I had a dolphin jump out of the water right beside me, closer than from me to you. And he had already jumped two times on this big wave. I saw it coming, and I paddled over into the peak of the wave and turned and stood up, and about 50 people were watching. And I knew he was going to jump the third time because they're very predictable. They jump. And they're surfing is what they're doing. They're jumping out of the wave, and they'll swim, and then I'll jump out of the wave. And it was about the exact time that he was going to jump, and I went right over there. I knew it was going to happen. I paddled right up into the wave, stood up, and was looking right at him when he jumped, and he jumped right beside me out of the water. I'm looking him in the eye. He's looking me in the eye, and about 50 people are screaming, going, unbelievable. And I knew it was going to happen, and it was just one of those special moments. Uh, surfing is, uh, is giving back, you know. Uh, Every time I'm in the water, even though I've been surfing 48 years and I've, I've been a champion surfer, I've been nominated to the East Coast Surfing Hall of Fame, every time I'm in the water, I'll see somebody that doesn't know how to surf. They've never been on a surfboard. And I'll paddle up to them and help them out. You know, I'll say, uh, you know, scoot back on your board a little bit or scoot up on your board a little bit. Try to stand up a little bit faster. Uh, you know, watch out for people riding waves. People that don't, don't have a clue, they, they don't watch what's going on around them. All they're doing is they're focused on them catching a wave. So they'll start paddling for a wave, and there'll be some guy coming down the line going 100 miles an hour, you know, got this perfect wave, and here's this guy dropping in in front of him on his stomach that has never caught a wave before. And it's dangerous, you know. They can stand up and fall right on top of you. Or, you know, they can get hurt. So basically I'm trying to warn them, I'm trying to help them, I'm trying to, you know, uh, it's just, just good to do, you know, because you don't want to see somebody get hurt. And some kids don't give back like they should. The older you get, it's better to give somebody a wave and receive a wave than to steal a wave and have somebody steal away from you. So if you basically, you know, I'll paddle out and there'll be a killer wave coming and there'll be somebody sitting on a shortboard right inside of me and I'll turn around and go, go, dude, that's your wave. And they'll paddle out it. Give me five and go, thanks, man, that was unreal. And I'll, you know, I know the guy's not a, not a very good surfer, but I gave him a really good wave. 
So he ends up just having a great day, and I get I get a warm spot in my heart from it. So.